This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, episode 697. This week, we're updating and adding photos to a great flashback show with Ed Light and the late Marty King. This was a great show on the assessment of smoke damage, which is once again a hot topic with all the wildfires, train wrecks, recycling fires. This show from 32312 is as relevant today as it was then. Let's learn from those that have been there and done that with Marty King and Ed Light. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget, after the show, we have afterthoughts.iaqradio.com. And we're going to follow up with uh, our sponsor, First On Site. IAQ Radio marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at acgih.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at RestorationIndustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc. at TSI.com, Tramex Meters at TramexMeters.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio trivia question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Don Weeks, Auto Ontario, Canada, who identified a circadian clock as the biochemical oscillator that cycles with a stable phase and is synchronized with solar time. This oscillator's in vivo period is close to 24 hours. That was a tough question, and he got it. The IQ Radio Trivia question for today, April 21, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Name the original division of the organization, which is now known as the Restoration Industry Association, that dealt with fire and smoke-related damages. Back to you, Joe. Today's guests are Martin King and Ed Light. Martin King was the Restoration Industries Association Technical Director for 30 years, where he developed a broad range of restoration procedures and published over 300 articles in trade journals. He currently serves as CEO of Martin Churchill Associates, Inc., Damage Investigators and Appraisers. He has testified as an expert witness on roofing, construction practice and cost, waterproofing, smoke and odor, the effects of fire and water damage on buildings and electronic components, mold remediation, and oriental rug damage. He has investigated and prepared formal reports on over 2,000 property damage cases, including replacement cost and fair market value of residential and commercial buildings. He has developed special expertise in the analysis of settled combustion particles, which he has broadened to the evaluation of wildfire residues. Joining Martin will be Ed Light. Ed Light is a senior fellow of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Ed has specialized in the investigation and control of indoor air quality concerns for over 30 years. His undergraduate studies were at the University of Massachusetts, and he holds a master's degree in environmental science from Marshall University. 
While with the West Virginia Department of Health, he developed pioneering protocols for the assessment of formaldehyde emissions, pesticide contamination, and the resolution of IAQ complaints. His consulting group, Building Dynamics, provides industrial hygiene and HVAC engineering services throughout the United States. Notable projects have included IAQ assessments of the White House, South Pole Station, and buildings impacted by 9-11. In his other life, Ed is first cheer banjoist with the all-new genetically altered Jug Band. Here with his own introductory music, Ed Light. Fire, fire, I heard the cry. Smell the smoke as it walks on by. All the world was cast in haze and gritty. Brothers and sisters in anguish pray. Raise their voices to heaven for aid. While the fire in ruin was laying fair, Baltimore, our beautiful city. And that's it. All right, well done. Okay, All excuse right. the low fidelity, but when that hit song was a uh, hit back a hundred years ago, that was about the fidelity of the 78 records. All right. Well, thank you very much for doing it. It's, it's great. And that was the first on IQ Radio. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what I'd like to do is set some background tone for the interview, and I've got a couple of introductory questions for Marty King. Okay. okay. Marty, in a fire damage situation, what does the word damage mean? Well, that's precisely the question that has to be answered. Uh, damage, as it's popularly uh, recognized, is uh, smoke particles or some change in appearance. Uh, but technically, damage is an alteration result, uh, that results in a loss of appearance, a loss of utility, loss in value. These are all subjective judgments, uh, and they vary from claim to claim and case to case. You know, after remediation or repair is completed, how is the efficacy of the work judged? Whether the policyholder complains or not. <laughs> Okay. Or I guess whether the contractor gets paid or not, probably too, I guess. That's a separate issue. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the dynamics of, of smoke during a fire? Yeah, I think it's necessary to distinguish between two principal types of fire, uh, the freely burning or blazing fire uh, that we most consider and smoldering fires. Um, many fires go through a smoldering phase, uh, longer or shorter, but some fires maintain the smoldering condition and the residues and the combustion products in general from a smoldering fire uh, almost represent a different category than those normally encountered. Um, the fire, of course, is a self-supporting oxidation reaction, I would call it exothermic, it produces heat, and that produces smoke. Uh, that definition covers every category of fire uh, and is applicable at the fire source. It has nothing to do with the, what the combustion products might do away from the fire. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah, it, it does. And But in terms of the smoke residue, the, the particulate that's distributed throughout the house, what are some of the factors or, or what influences the distribution? Well, the first influence is the amount of heat that's generated by the fire, which produces a strong 
a positive pressure uh, and propel smoke because they call it heat driven smoke. Uh, that's one factor. Uh, another important factor uh, is the rate of combustion, that is how much smoke is produced. Uh, and the third factor are the normal air currents, convection currents that exist in the structure uh, independent of the fire, which ultimately the fire residues uh, begin to be propelled by. So that at first it may be the heat of the fire replaced by normal convection currents. In the case of a smoldering fire, there's not enough heat generated to drive the smoke so that the uh, smoke essentially is controlled by existing convection currents, uh, influenced often by the pressure difference between the exterior and interior. If the exterior is warmer than the interior, then there's a tendency for smoke to flow inwards. If the interior temperature is warmer than the exterior temperature, then there's a tendency for the uh, smoke plume and air currents in general to move from the interior to the exterior. So that pressure differences uh, have to be considered, in particular when you're looking at the possibility of an exterior fire source, such as a wildfire. But in terms of smoke, as the heat of combustion diminishes, then the normal pressure differences take hold, and we begin to see particles depositing as a result of those pressure differences. For example, uh, a cooler closet will attract air currents and whatever is being carried by the air currents. So we generally say the smoke tends to move towards lower energy levels, which is to say cooler areas. Uh, not just a closet, but uh, dresser drawers, uh, any areas that tend to be cooler than the ambient interior air. Okay. Joe. Yes, Marty, you, you mentioned free burning, uh, blazing fire versus a smoldering fire, and, and you described very well how they there's different smoke distribution and that that is one of the factors with respect to the smoke distribution. Is there also different particulate and, um, you know, byproduct as the result of these two different types of fires and, and how do you look at that? Well, the most people in the restoration business know that a smoldering fire has a much more penetrating and pungent odor. Uh, this represents the fact that the fuel is less fully consumed, less fully combusted, so that the byproducts are often, the particles tend to be uh, sticky, uh, smeary, uh, and smell a lot worse. At the same time, that type of fire produces uh, particles in areas where you would not normally expect to find them. Uh, the fuel uh, is a separate category, uh, represents the chemical properties of the uh, combustion products, uh, which generally are not really considered very seriously unless uh, plastics are involved and we have potential corrosion of uh, electrical circuits, uh, computers, TVs, or in a commercial setting, uh, the corrosion uh, damage can be severe, such as in a print shop or a sheet metal shop, for example. 
how do they verify traditionally whether or not a surface has been impacted by smoke residue or whether smoke residue is present, Marty? Well, traditionally, it's simply a casual visual observation, uh, maybe amplified by wiping something, uh, an absorbent material over a surface uh, to see if that collects more residue that then becomes visible. Uh, but it's normally just a purely visible assessment combined with odor. If there is no smoke visible or no particles visible and no odor, in most cases, it would be determined, and I'm not saying correctly determined, but in most cases, it would be determined that no damage has occurred. Uh, in fact, substantial damage may have occurred uh, that doesn't fit into either of those two criteria, that is, clearly visible particle damage or odor. And I just wanted to, um, you know, we had gone through a little bit about some, some basic background on what is damage, um, how smoke is distributed, uh, a little bit about the difference between uh, pre-burning and smoldering type fires, and then we started a little into the traditional assessment of these fires. And I, I just wanted to, before we went too far along, give you an opportunity to add anything on those topics that you would like to add. Well, up to now, uh, this has not been the, the realm of indoor environmental science or industrial hygienists. And the basic understanding in cleanup has been well developed by the restoration trade. Uh, there is a lot to be learned in terms of the chemistry, uh, health implications, and the possibility of more quantified type uh, testing to assess an area and possibly to verify cleanup. And those have remained wide open questions. This is a very significant indoor air quality problem. However, it hasn't had the, the uh, sexiness of uh, toxic molds and VOCs that get all the research and certainly tons of money behind uh, commercial work. And it's essentially an undeveloped, very interesting area scientifically, but a very common problem and uh, significant economically and uh, certainly a terrible situation uh, for the occupants uh, you know, of a smoke-damaged residence or building, and also a real concern for the liability of restoration companies in terms of documenting and backing up what they're doing and and possibly developing uh, more effective uh, ways to uh, to deal with this problem. You know, I've got a question that I would like you to both answer. Um, how would sampling be done if either a, a hygienist or a restoration contractor wanted to determine, you know, whether carbon was present. How would they actually gather the samples? Marty? Do you want to answer that, Dad, or shall I? Well, or do you uh, want to go first? I'll just give a general answer, and Marty is truly the expert and the most experienced person on this subject. Uh, air, air sampling is pointless for this and actually for most other IAQ situations. Uh, and what we're uh, interested in is whether or not a surface is contaminated. And what many people uh, testing for IAQ uh, don't seem to get a good grasp on is that contamination is a difference from normal background. And you don't just go out and test and get numbers and then try to uh, make something out of those numbers after the fact. Uh, you really have to understand that there is a normal background of particles and combustion particles out there, and uh, there is no accepted standard method or standards uh, for this type of testing. The concept is to test the surfaces, look for contamination, and to some degree this can be correlated at least loosely with whether or not there is damage. 
and there currently is a real controversy in this area. Uh, and uh, Marty and I, or Marty has developed a testing method, and I've fine-tuned it a bit. Uh, and we're now contrasting this actually in litigation with other industrial hygienists who basically use a, uh, an asbestos method that's inappropriate to look at percent of uh, black particles and dust, which really doesn't tell us much. And uh, Marty, I, I'm sure you can add to that. <clears throat> well, uh, it goes back to Cliff's first question of what is damage. Uh, there are combustion particles present in virtually every building or home. Uh, and the question is whether the particles that are being examined are new or the result of a peril, a known peril, such as a fire, uh, or whether they're due to highway traffic uh, or ambient conditions outside of the building being tested. We typically will take lift samples. Um, lift samples can be taken with sticky tape and then mounted on a glass slide and examined under magnification. And I prefer 100 power magnification which enables me to distinguish combustion particles from a host of other particles which are also present, which we normally would refer to as dust. Uh, so that whether a given level, number one, is unusual, can really only be determined, and this is a fairly new conclusion of mine because for some months I've been involved in collecting samples from people, people's homes all over the country. I've been sending out uh, sample lift packages where three rooms are tested and we ask that they test areas that are not likely to be cleaned and what I have found is that there is no reliable background level that uh, can be referred to across the country. Some areas uh, have background levels of smoke that we would continue, can normally construe to be damage. And that's their normal background condition. The only way to establish what a reliable background condition might be would be to take lift samples from adjoining properties that were not subject to the particular peril that we're looking at. Uh, if you're looking at it, the results of an interior fire. Uh, as I look at the results of sampling, I have concluded that a lot of smoke damage uh, well, I won't say damage, a lot of smoke concentration goes unnoticed and untested because it simply is not apparent to unaided visual examination, which is the standard test that's used. Now, as Ed said, the area of damage lies outside the realm of environmental hygiene. Uh, there are no tests or standards that they can apply or test protocol that they can follow that's applicable to combustion products. So typically, the laboratories use what protocols they have principally for examining for asbestos particles and for carbon black, both of which uh, have ASTM protocols approved, and both of which are useless in assessing particle damage from fires. Uh, but convincing the profession that those procedures are inappropriate uh, hasn't been too easy. 
But I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but obviously this is a subject that can go on. What we have done in assessing the level of visible damage is to appropriate the grayscale function in windows, and there are other uh, ways of doing this besides the windows function, but in windows you have grayscales that can be printed uh, in percentage increments from 10% to 100%, and uh, we've set up a chart whereby you can compare the existing discoloration to uh, an existing grayscale, and then can say, well, this has a 10% opacity or 20% opacity. Uh, that's essentially where we're headed. Martin, when you look at these various particles and these tape lifts under 100 magnification, is there a database that you compare them to that would say, you know, this is diesel soot, uh, this is wood from a, that burnt from a fireplace, this is burnt plastic. I mean, is there an existing database that's published? There's no existing database for anything other than combustion particles in general. Okay. I doubt that it is possible, given the variation in particles, which of course vary with the fuel, vary with the rate of combustion, uh, that it would be possible to put together any meaningful general standard in that regard. So I can say flatly that you cannot tell the difference between uh, combustion from the fuel oil or from natural gas, uh, from kerosene. Uh, the combustion particles of all of those would be the same, except that if the fire spreads from a pure fuel source so that other materials are involved, then the residues take on a markedly different appearance and have a different significance. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but <laughs> well, I can I, can, I would interpret it. You know, from from my uh, experience, uh, you know, uh, interpreting IQ data, uh, you generally can't do from one sample or looking at one particle. It's it's relative, and my hope is in developing this method is that we look at patterns of samples. If we take lots of uh, samples in relation to the location of different sources uh, and perhaps in, in even in different structures, uh, by co comparing these, the, you know, the basic combustion particles look similar, uh, but for example, if you have a, a, a point source like a, a candle or incense uh, in one room, uh, you'll get real localized deposition there and it will really uh, taper off pretty quickly. If you're in a home that's been surrounded by a wildfire, like we've had uh, quite a few serious fires out west the last several years, uh, you generally will find the pattern of samples to be pretty similar from room to room, uh, which may suggest a source. Uh, so again, the interpretation of the sample is relative. You have to have a good sampling strategy, understand the history, location of the of the sources, and then you have a possibility of at least estimating what sources are producing what. Uh, there is also available to industrial hygienists uh, an atlas through McCrone Company of pictures and discussion of every type of particle you can see under a microscope, uh, but you will find general combustion particles look, look pretty similar. You can't really differentiate them. But one of the, uh, the things we do in our analysis is to also uh, identify as best we can the other particles and fibers. And those often give us clues as to what's going on in the home, uh, and, uh, for example, in some cases, there may be a lot of other stuff in the sample that's actually contributing to the opacity of the, of the overall slide. And, and, uh, in Marty's technique, you, you look at the, uh, 
the uh, the uh, chart of the different opacities of the and you compare that to your overall slide. Then you look under the microscope, and in some cases you'll see under the microscope most of the slide is covered up by clearly combustion particles. Other time it's covered up by other all kinds of other stuff. So you don't want to blame that on the on the combustion. So it's not a simple answer or a simple number, but with experience and comparison, uh, you can start to sort out what's going on. And nothing in a, beats in a good investigation. Very thorough interviews, very detailed inspections, and using logic and common sense. And you can't just bop into a place and run a test and pretend you know anything. Gotcha. All right. It seems like this is a good time for halftime. Uh, please, Marty and Ed, hang on with us, and we're going to break for halftime. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org. AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC. CRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee. AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, HealthyIndoors.com. Yeah, I'd just like to, uh, what I'd like to do uh, is, um, clarify one thing that, that Martin said. Mark, you, you had mentioned having samples sent in from around the country, and I wasn't clear on whether those were from homes where there was a fire of some type or homes where there was no fire or a combination of both. Well, along with the samples, there's a questionnaire card containing about 10 questions. Uh, obviously, samples alone would be meaningless unless you have some idea of what the uh, nature of the installation is. So we do ask if there's ever been a fire in the home or in the neighborhood. We ask whether anyone smokes in the home. We ask whether they burn candles. If so, how often? We ask if there's a fireplace in the home, and if so, how often it's used. Um, about, I said about 10 questions that we ask that we ask what type of neighborhood the residence is in, whether it's urban, city, rural. We ask whether there is a, a highway nearby. We try to eliminate or at least to describe as many alternate sources as possible. Um, and of course, none of that speaks to the general ambient conditions of the region, uh, which if there were a forest fire, it could be 20 miles away and still have a substantial impact. So we try to eliminate as many alternative sources as possible, but the variation in a given site that has had a fire or been exposed to forest fire, the variation within that site exceeds the variation that we get by region or by other factor. So that the idea that there might be a standard uh, is essentially meaningless, even from a diagnostic 
uh, or scientific point of view, but it's doubly meaningless from a damage point of view, which actually has very little to do with the component of the smoke. Now, there is one area where edge specialty, which he has described well, uh, coincides with damage, and that is when individuals are present who are extremely vulnerable to certain types of chemical impurities in the air. And in that case, it's possible that there can be a correlation between, and this would involve air testing, a correlation between what's present from the fire and damage. And in that case, damage would have a different meaning than it would in the case of someone or a site that didn't have people with those vulnerabilities. So all of that speaks to the great variation in what damage is. Uh, the same damage can have different significance depending on other factors, such as the nature of the inhabitants. And, and I, so you, you're trying to get a background, as I understand it, um, regionally and then within homes that have had a fire. And I'm, and you're essentially right now focusing on the amount of material byproducts from the fire on surfaces and that is just one component obviously because you know I, I would imagine another source of damage is, is lingering odors for instance am i correct in assuming that you're right now just focusing on the byproducts on surfaces and really not um trying to tackle the odor issue at this point well since damage in general and odor but even greater degree is a matter of subjective response that you can never separate the idea of an odor uh, with any other interpretation than what people who smell it think they smell mm -hmm. and how significant that is. Now, we know that the sense of smell, the experience of odor, has a very high emotional component. Uh, in one phase, it connects, uh, from a scientific standpoint, directly to the amygdala, which is the seat of emotions. And we frequently find that if a person has a severely traumatic experience in a fire, someone is injured, uh, or even the simple shock of the incident generates a much more emotional response to even trace odors than it does to most people. So you can't, uh, well, first of all, you can't really measure damage, a smoke damage in odor. Uh, it's not measurable because there are no instruments that are as sensitive as the human nose. Okay, thank you, Marty. Cliff? Yeah, actually, this is kind of a toss-up question, and I would like both Ed and, and Marty to, to, to comment on it. You know, what is your impression of the, the, the extent that we go to in a mold remediation situation in, in, in terms of being concerned about uh, fragments, fungal fragments inside of wall cavities and ceiling cavities and so on and so forth. I guess what my question is, I guess the easiest way to answer it, uh, based on your experience, would you say we overdo it in terms of remediation in water damage situation or mold remediation situations and underdo it in fire situations? Or would you say we're just appropriate in both cases? Well, it depends. I guess on whose standards you're following, there are fairly well developed standards for mold particles, mold fragments, and what is acceptable. 
there exist no standards for smoke damage. Uh, so therefore, uh, the standard that is applied is the standard that works. Basically, as I said earlier, the level at which the client stops complaining. Ed, do you have a different take on that? Sure. Uh, uh, actually, in the last two questions, uh, as far as odor, I think uh, Marty's addressing the overall uh, concept of damage and the customer's point of view. Uh, in my practice, odor is a very important diagnostic tool for uh, indoor air quality investigation. And we tried to make it as objective as possible uh, as far as having trained investigators and multiple opinions. And uh, in, the, in the case of uh, smoke damage, you know, smoke combustion products have a unique smell compared to other smells. Uh, and this is a, a very important part of the assessment and then of checking the cleanup. Uh, the big project that Marty and I have been involved in is after the fact historical wildfire damage where several months to a few years later the combustion particles are still on the surfaces but the odor is gone and so the actual focus of our research has been more on the surface particles. Odor is important uh, and uh, as far as uh, what how far we're going with mold remediation. It's my experience that especially with the new wave of mold testers, unfortunately, in, including many of my brother and sister industrial hygienists, uh, their evaluation is superficial. Uh, the extent of the water damage and the repair is based on the moisture dynamics of the building. There's no shortcuts to that. So what I see in my practice is great overreactions where based on a few samples they decide the whole place needs to be gutted and the contractor and the consultants make lots of money or on the other hand uh, they take a very limited view of what they can see in a few tests and then they ignore all the hidden uh, moisture and mold and the biggest problem with many of the investigations now is they don't understand the root cause of what you know it's it's not a mold problem it's a moisture problem to get to the heart of it and correct that. Uh, so the, uh, there really are no shortcuts. It takes a thorough uh, knowledge of the structure and restoration principles. And industrial hygiene and testing is a relatively small component. In fact, I think the more industrial hygienists and testers have become involved in mold, the more mucked up the field has become in terms of effectiveness and wasted resources. But uh, that's my personal opinion. I got a question, uh, actually more for Martin than, than for you, Ed. Martin, uh, certainly in your many years of experience and the numerous claims that you've been on, you've encountered public adjusters and public adjusters will want, you know, walls opened, uh, because there's fire contaminant inside the walls. It might not be an odor problem, but, you know, they want the walls ripped out so that they can get inside and just remove this particulate. What are some tactics or strategies, uh, you know, that can be utilized in offsetting that claim? Well, we can first say that public adjusters are very good at enlisting expert testimony that supports their position, which leads to one important consideration, which is who is hired the person that's doing the testing. In other words, who are they working for? And if we look at today's marketplace, we say, we have, I'd have to say that the firm recommended by the insurance company is just as contaminated as the firm hired by the public adjuster. In other words, uh, time after time, and, and now it's getting even more extreme where the adjuster who knows nothing about the situation is writing specifications for the restoration contractor who would never 
think of opposing the hand that feeds them. So that's one aspect of the problem. Uh, the other, it, it seems to me, aspect would be if something is claimed, then testing should be performed. Okay, we'll open the walls in the rooms that are most likely to have been affected. And if those are open and tested and found negative, then you would have to decline that. If, on the other hand, they're open, and sometimes public addresses are right, if you open the cavity and find combustion particles, then the removal of those particles would be a part of the claim. So, uh, on the one extreme, we do nothing. On the other extreme, we do everything. Uh, seems to me the better course is to test and establish if any walls have to be removed. Now, it's true some expense is incurred there. And it's also true that insurance adjusters are not interested in spending that money if it's an individual who's filing a claim. <clears throat> if it's a public adjuster, uh, they'd be more inclined to uh, extend their payments to the cost of testing. But um, th this might sound like a somewhat cynical point of view, but if you have a background such as you, Cliff, had, along with many others, for whom proper restoration is a matter of ethical principle rather than economic convenience, uh, that's the reason why I take what some people might think is an obnoxious attitude. If I could uh, fill in here, uh, we don't necessarily mean quantitative testing in the approach that I take in indoor contamination as far as subsurface stuff is you evaluate the condition, the history, and you predict uh, where it might be most likely to have hidden or subsurface conditions and make a few small exploratory holes and usually what you can get visually or rubbing or using a moisture meter at that point is about all the testing you need to do. Uh, and you don't necessarily need to get quantitative about it. Uh, and our approach is very limited access in, uh, uh, inspection holes. And if we don't find anything in worst case, then we advise that, that uh, you know, the investigation can stop. If we find some, then the task becomes to define a boundary, and basically we leave that up to the restoration contract. We say start tearing and go to the extent of what you see and feel, and, and then if we're involved as industrial hygiene, you come in and look at it and basically verify. This is more in the case of water damage. The industrial hygienists are not asked to come in routinely and look at uh, fire damage restoration unless it becomes an official hazmat type problem, you know, the asbestos or PCBs get out there, uh, or in the case of these new insurance claims on the wildfires where the insurance companies are bringing in industrial hygienists to run tests which aren't uh, relevant or validated as far as smoke, but they are running tests and usually ruling out homes with smoke damage from being cleaned under homeowner policy. Uh, but we shouldn't talk about that because it's under litigation. <laughs> well, you know, you, both both of both guests discussed the fact and mentioned the fact that there are background levels of combustion byproducts, you know, that are in all homes, whether there's been a fire or not. Uh, you know, someone may have burned candles, and you know, they have this history, and we end up with carbon or fire related, you know, what appear to be combustion related particles inside of a wall cavity it would seem that virtually any wall cavity that you opened, you would find some combustion byproducts. The question is whether they were related to a peril that occurred in the house or, or whether they weren't. And I guess that's re really my question. How would you, you know, the fact we open the wall, we find something in there. Um, how do we determine whether it was related to the particular peril or it was a pre-existing condition? One of the... Okay, go ahead, Mari. One of the reasons I like lift samples <clears throat> is because it gives you 
a picture of the particles in their original configuration as they existed. Now, smoke, no matter what other materials may be present, smoke appears as a layer on top of all of the other particles so that it has almost a laminar structure with a layer of smoke and then other particles beneath it. In the case of a wall cavity, uh, usually they're not cleaned during construction before they install the drywall. So that you can have in a wall, wall cavity every conceivable kind of construction dust, including drywall dust, including wood particles, uh, including fiberglass particles from the insulation. But only the smoke will be there as a top layer. So that no matter how much of the other materials are present, that top layer tells the story, which can be easily determined from a lift sample because in the lift sample, the top layer is on top and the other materials are beneath it. So you can then take a microscopic slide and look at the surface and you can flip it over and look at the back and you can see what materials were there and of course depending on the quantity of other materials that are there gives you an idea of how long it's been since that surface was clean if it ever was so uh, that's an aspect regarding to the particles clip uh, that i think needs to be considered uh, i think it's a very one of, one of the good things point. that that i'm seeing in our samples which you know we've looked at maybe several dozen samples and we don't have any research funding. We can't be statistically significant. But I'm seeing in samples where the home is not affected by wildfire and sites that are away from any kind of point source that we're calculating a concentration of surface combustion particles per area in our tape lifts. And we do see them as background, but the numbers, the concentrations are are very low when we're away from point sources in wildfires and relatively much higher when you're at a point source like right next to the candle or the smoker or in a home that's been in an area with a lot of wildfire smoke throughout. Uh, and we can't offer an exact standard, but uh, again, my approach to indoor air quality evaluation is uh, not absolute numbers, but relative uh, to normal background, and I think this may be possible with combustion particles, and it only gives a partial conclusion. Uh, you, you can't, by testing alone, come to a firm conclusion on anything with indoor air quality. You have to also account for your observations and the history and, uh, and knowledge of the building science and so on. Okay. I think at this point we're going to go to a roundup. Okay, I think we're going to go with Joe first, then Dieter, then me, and then Val. Okay, Joe. All right, let, let me try and summarize real quick. Uh, you gentlemen are working on a project that led you to sort of develop this surface assessment protocol. You're looking at kind of a concentration of these combustion particles. You're trying to compare them to what is normal background. You're doing some research on what is normal background. Um, you're, you're basing this somewhat on, on a contribution to the discoloration on a tape lift slide. Um, but you're also ensuring that the sampling strategy is also based on the inspection, which considers the sources, pathways, and cleaning history. You're, you're doing some of an opacity evaluation using an optical microscope for your examination. Um, you're doing a, a kind of a relative particle count to, to calculate the concentration, kind of using the grayscale on windows. And it may be used to help determine the difference between source contribution, um, contamination boundaries, and then assist with determining the restoration procedures. Is that a pretty fair summary of what we're talking about? 
I think it's a very thorough summary. I'll just make one correction that we didn't initiate this process with a specific current assignment. I've been doing this work for years, and <clears throat> I know that Ed has been on his side, has been looking at similar situations for years. I uh, started doing particle analysis uh, back in 93. So, uh, great. Not, <laughs> one, one thing I not a recent development. Uh, my belief is that this type of testing we're looking at doesn't necessarily need to be routinely done, doesn't, you know, everybody doesn't have to run in with labs and testers involved in routine smoke damage problems. What we really need to do is research on this, uh, and we haven't got into the chemistry and the potential health risks and the routes of exposure from these surface particles, which is another real interesting subject. Uh, my feeling is we need to do better research on this, and then it's very likely that most situations can be handled by the qualitative and traditional inspection means uh, and cleared similarly, uh, but uh, having these quantitative tools uh, can be very helpful in critical or complicated situations, uh, situations where health is a, is a real issue. Uh, and we're really just getting started looking at this. Again, without research grants, we are pretty limited in how many samples we can look at. And, and again, I don't think we're leading towards a huge uh, smoke testing industry like we have with the mold testing industry that's uh, really needed to uh, take care of these situations. We just need to understand it better and use the, use the tools where appropriate. That's, that's very fair and I think a, a a reasonable and uh, well thought out opinion on that, and I appreciate that. What I'd like to do though is just encourage everyone. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, Cliff uh, Glenn Feldman was on the show and announced that the RIA IESO standard for uh, evaluation. Let me make sure I have the exact name: evaluation of HVAC mechanical system surfaces to determine the impact from fire-related particulate had been had been finalized, but I have not been able to get a final copy of it, and I haven't, I don't know if it's actually out for um, public uh, purchase at this point in time, but I assume you guys will be working with um, RIA and IESO in, in trying to help them with additional standards they may be considering for similar types of um, testing that, uh, to what you're proposing here. Well, actually, uh they have a small group working on that, and they uh, they really haven't uh, worked with us on it. We're very interested in the subject. The uh, the draft I saw that seemed rather vague and uh, subjective to me, but I, I haven't seen the final yet. Uh, but they have a group working on it, and we're uh, pursuing that independently, and uh, we ought to work together, I would say. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, you know, he uh, doesn't have to go to Brazil. He doesn't have to go to Brazil to uh, find a concern for the products from combustion residues. In Germany, uh, according to a paper that Ed sent me recently that he encountered, uh, <clears throat> health officials customarily take air samples after fires of a certain level of severity that is in general exceeding uh, one room and one reason for this is that in Germany it's very common to use foam insulation and the, off, the byproducts of, comb of combusted foam insulation are very serious indeed. They are very and nasty, yes indeed. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, Ed might want to talk or look at that, but in other words, some countries take this more seriously than others do. In this country, it is utterly ignored, uh, except as an air quality, general air quality question. I guess it's my turn. Uh, I guess Marty, Ed, uh, even, even Dieter, uh, all of... 
you are familiar with mold remediation projects and the worker protection. They have the workers running around in Tyvek suits and respirators and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, what my question is, is do you think that fire restoration remediation worker should be wearing the same type of protective gear doing fire restoration as is specified for mold remediation? Um, <clears throat> you want to address that, Ed? Well, actually, uh, my title is industrial hygienist, but uh, my experience is really with the air quality evaluation, not with the personal protection. And Marty being involved in many more projects might have a better feel than me. My, my general opinion is any kind of demolition or cleanup, you need particulate protection. Yeah. Uh, and we don't fully understand the, the gas exposure. Uh, you know, when we talk about odor, there is gases coming off the particles and gassing, off gassing from the surfaces, uh, which may or may not really be an occupational hazard. Uh, but certainly minimum, you want respiratory protection. And then the question is how, how far do you go with the respiratory protection? And other industrial hygienists and experienced restoration people have a better feel for that than me. Marty? Um, I think in the case of fire damage and mold as well, that when you have a standard, the standard is usually established for worst case conditions, which only apply in a very small portion of losses or of damage. Worst case conditions are met by adhering to the standards, which by definition means that they're excessive for probably 90%. Now, how excessive uh, doesn't make any difference because you have a standard. And I find that frequently in litigation, companies are subject to damages if their employees are not using appropriate protection. Whether or not it's necessary or not, that's irrelevant. It's whether or not they are adhering to a standard. Now, in the case of, of smoke, initially, that is the first responders or the first restoration responders definitely should wear some form of respiratory protection. I don't think it has to go any necessarily any further uh, than I-95, but um, they definitely need it. Once there has been a full air change, and that might be a week or so later, the level of particles in the air falls off to about a tenth of what they were immediately after the fire, so that different levels of protection will be necessary depending on uh, in my opinion, one, <clears throat> the time it's expired since the uh, fire, uh, and two, the chemical composition of the fire, <clears throat> which in the case of mold is not a factor, but in the case of fire it would be because some types of fuel are much more dangerous than others. If you go to worst case, employee protection or worker protection, then you're going to incur substantial expense for no reason whatsoever, because there comes to be a time when uh, only a dust mask and gloves are all that are necessary, and one could take that as a general minimum. Uh, but I think that procedures, in addition to worker protection, certain procedures such as air exchange and evacuation of the damaged areas or isolation of damaged areas from other areas uh, should also be considered, uh, which makes the possibility of a standard 
in my opinion, uh, it makes the argument weaker than the argument against having a standard. Okay. Val? Uh, yes, Ed and Marty, we always like to give our guests the last word. Is there any final comment that you would like to add? And also, if you'd like to uh, provide your contact info so our listeners can get in touch with you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ed. Well, I think we covered a, a, a lot of stuff. Uh, we, I have considered the chemistry, the, the potential exposures, health implications, and with a lack of research, these are really very preliminary and theoretical. Uh, my main point is more research is really needed on this area, and, and no attention has been uh, paid to it. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me uh, at Building Dynamics. We're in Maryland, uh, 2408996926. And uh, Marty? Yeah, well, my email is martinch, M-A-R-T-I-N-C-H, at arrows, E-R-O-L-S dot com. Uh, my telephone number at present is in a state of limbo. Uh, as a result of negotiations uh, with Verizon and Comcast. So uh, I'll give you my cell number, which is probably more useful. It's 703-819-1383. And I'm happy to talk about anyone that wants, wants to discuss this type of situation. Okay. Before we leave, we want to thank today's guests, Ed Light, Martin King, my co-host, Radio Joe Hughes, our engineer, Val Bender, our technical director, Dr. Dietrich Wall. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our growing audience of loyal listeners. Please come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next broadcast of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.